Right. Hello, good, uh, well, it's not morning anymore, but good, uh, exactly, good noon um, to my talk, uh, Fedora Core as an action in the context of uh, operating system for virtual appliances. And uh, when I started to think about uh, giving a talk at DevConf um, in general, I thought, well, Fedora Core as surely I will be the first one. Turns out absolutely no. If you just look at the talks given at DevConf about CoreOS in general, um, there are a lot of talks. And um, so uh, a lot of topics were already covered. Um, surprisingly enough, when I looked at the talks or skipped through them one by one, I um, saw that not a lot of practice experience uh, was already shared. Um, only for example, um, uh, the 2021 uh, up and running with Fedora Core S or getting started with Fedora Core S are really intended to give you an introduction to Fedora Core S. Um, a lot of the other ones are just deep dives into certain features or certain aspects or uh, yada, yada, yada of Fedora Core S. So that was a bit surprising. Um, so I thought, well, that's a good gap for me because I have a little bit of um, practical experience I can um, give you about Fedora Core S. And um, this is uh, what we are um, talking about today. So what do I mean with in action? Because that could mean any anything. Um, this is uh, the concluded experience from mainly me, but also um, some colleagues in current company uh, or in former companies. And um, when I started working with Fedora KS, um, we basically then started uh, from scratch. So there wasn't really anything. Um, also means um, the last point, limited experience, <laughs> we also had uh, scratch experience. So. Fedora Core S at that point was a new word for me. Um, and also virtual appliances were a new word for me. Um, and uh, in concluded now, it's about one year, maybe a little bit more of um, experience developing and supporting a virtual appliance or other use cases on Fedora Core OS. So I have some things and I matured in a way, but <laughs> to that point we will come. Good table of content. Um, I will give, give a very quick basic introduction to um, what a virtual appliance is, what a Fedora Core OS operating system is. If uh, this will not be um, enough information to you to fully understand the whole slides, uh, well, good thing. Um, hopefully, there will be a YouTube video of, uh, of this if nothing goes wrong. And um, so we just recheck um, the links that I put into the slides and uh, then just have a look at the talk again. Um, then uh, we will come to, okay, I now understand what a virtual appliance is, what a Fedora Core is, is meant to be. Uh, how do I actually get started developing? Again, here I will provide some links for further um, reading and um, testing, tutorializing. And um, once you are over the proof of concept phase, now it gets into the real interesting problems. The, how do you actually get production ready? How do you uh, make now this proof of concept into a real product that your customer can actually use? And uh, of that or after that, um, my personal experience or more personal experience, um, especially points that we did that I think uh, I did not use as intended. Uh, and then, of course, the normal last chapters, conclusion, questions, uh, thanks, and uh, the appendings, if we have the time. If not, uh, we'll have to look in the slides. Um, also, note that um, please put your answer or questions directly into the chat so they are not forgotten. would be a shame. And then I will go over it at the end. And, and furthermore, as mentioned already, I will have links all across the slides. And they have cryptic numbers just on them, like you see in scientific writing. Um, so um, be sure to access the slides as a PDF 
um, in uh, dots thread. I'm not sure uh, the the schedule thingy website where the slides are uploaded, uh, so you can actually access them for further reading. Good. Oh, and um, I'm trying out a lot of stuff today with this presentation. So please give me feedback with anything that you uh, that occurs to you as um, as feedback worthy. Good. So let's start finally with the talk itself, the basics. So uh, what is Fedora Core S? Fedora Core S at first is a quite minimalistic operating system that has uh, one major focus uh, or one of the major focus is container execution. So uh, this, for example, means um, you do not have to think about oof, which container execution um, uh, how it's called exec uh, container runtime do I need? Which one do I should I install? Which one can I install? It's actually supported with Fedora Quest. You just get Podman out of the box and it runs really well. And it's also really well supported. I never had problems with um, Podman on it. Um, another interesting point is uh, Fedora Core is not like uh, your usual Ubuntu Manjaro Arch Linux image. So when you first boot Fedora Core S, uh, you will see that there is no such thing as an install script, as an install graphical user interface, nothing. It just boots up. Basically, what you have for Fedora Core S is always uh, a disk, more or less, with the full operating system already on it. So the startup is also pretty easy in the first setup. Um, beyond that, uh, we have that first setup, but that is just more, more or less a skeleton. You fill that skeleton with something called uh, ignition. Um, and this ignition uses, if I'm not wrong, cloud init to do certain stuff in the in the operating system during boot. So for example, uh, creating system D units, uh, creating files, creating folders, whatever you like, um, has a lot of things you can do. And also a note, uh, this is mainly where uh, I developed uh, Fedora Core S. I did not touch Fedora Core S itself. I mainly interacted with the ignition and uh, which files do I put where and scripts and what yada, yada, yada. Um, good. And um, also very interesting about Fedora Core S, which will get important later also, is some parts of Fedora Core S are immutable. Um, there's also a quite interesting block entry. I think it's link number two. Um, but also have a look at that because often it's referenced as an immutable operating system, which it is not. Otherwise, you could not write anything anywhere. You can write to certain folders, so it's just partly immutable. But even though just some parts are immutable, that can greatly help later on. And then uh, what is appliance or virtual appliance? Appliance is a package that contains all your software in one package. Uh, everything is included to run it. So um, the virtual appliance is just the same thing, but with the operating system. So basically, it's a virtual machine. But uh, your application is on there, default configuration maybe, um, default resource files, whatever is needed, uh, that your application as a default instance of what you want to deliver your customer is already there and just needs a hypervisor or bare metal and then go. Um, yes, so that's oh, not, a bare, not bare metal, just hypervisors in that case. Um, so that's a virtual appliance. And now why should you choose exactly this combination? Because you can deliver a virtual appliance more or less with any operating system, as I said, with Ubuntu, with Arch Linux, with whatever you like. Um, I think Fedora Core S is a good match for the reasons just uh, set with the minimalistic idea of the operating system, but also it's quite easy to maintain for uh, certain reasons. And um, by that, I mean, uh, it has a feature that automatically applies updates. And uh, they are very careful about applying updates in such a manner that uh, it does not break any system. So uh, it's not just some update. And well, if it breaks something at the operating system, we don't care. It's carefully done. Of course, there will be breaking changes, but that's another matter. Um, good. And also, it's just another way to ship your application, especially 
I have the feeling that software engineers in my generation of software engineers uh, always think about containers and they are only containers. Uh, but of course, it's not only containers. You can ship your application if it's a Java application, just as a jar. If that fits the exact use case you have and the customers you have and compliance and whatever controls, maybe that's a good solution. Maybe also the virtual appliance is a good solution um, to also deliver a virtual machine with it. Could could be a good fit. fit. Um, and of course, there are official use cases and also what I like anti-use cases for Fedora KS. So that's pretty nice. And I see that I'm talking too much about the basics. So I just uh, make it quick with the next point. Why did I choose it? Well, I did not have a big choice. It was a legacy when I started working with Fedora KS and virtual appliances. They already had, uh, there was already a proof of concept. So that's, that's it. And currently, I'm working uh, for the Fedora Core is just because I now am used to it and I enjoy it very much. Good. How do you start developing? That's a very short slide. Um, usually, norm, oh, at the beginning, initially, I thought, well, I want to also show you or present you or at least give you some scripts. Um, due to time limitations, that was not possible. If you want scripts, uh, want to see how I would approach a script, a build script, for example, uh, let me know and I will um, create one. Um, besides that, have a look at the linked resources because they have, they spend their main point of the video or the talk is to give you an introduction. So this is way more than I could give you now in these 20 minutes. And also besides that, I strongly recommend VirtualBox, but that's just a personal preference. VirtualBox just always worked on any platform. So on uh, Linux machines and Mac machines and uh, one or two times also on Windows machines. Uh, VirtualBox just worked for this combination, Fedora Chorus and Virtual Appliances. I uh, also tried uh, Kimu, for example, on Mac um, in preparation of this talk. And somehow I was not able to fully uh, get it to work. Not sure why. And also VMware, for example, needs another step until you can import uh, a virtual appliance. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. So, okay, now to get to the important part. Um, so when you are thinking and you have your proof of concept already there and it works to some degree pretty good and you think, oh, well, we shall continue with that one. And then there's a the question, okay, now, how do we get this to production? How do we make, how do we actually solve the problem of our customer? Um, and you may have certain constraints while thinking about that. Um, one of the more important constraints is, will your virtual appliance be online? So has it a connection to the internet? And can it also be connected from the internet or not? Um, because if you thinking about, well, we have upgrades and I don't know, we just put some up, uh, upgrade files um, for our virtual appliance somewhere uh, central, uh, like Artifactory or something um, with a public IP and that's fine. If you, some of your customers only want to apply or run your virtual appliance in a complete offline environment, what do you got to do? So you also have to think about how to, um, Covered these cases. Um, and also, then, when we're already talking about uh, updating, oh, by the way, I'm using upgrading and updating interchangeably. Um, so the update path is the same as the Fedora Core OS, I think, more or less. At some point, you always have breaking changes. That's at some points in the development, that's just, I think, uh, what, what it sometimes happened. Um, and then to not break the systems of your customers, you need to follow a certain update path. Um, so first this version and this version, and then they are fine to do whatever they want, but they have to follow this path first. Otherwise something goes very wrong and you get a call at 3 a.m., which nobody wants. <laughs> and so that's also a thing. Uh, do you really, do you want to maybe to prepare these kind of things? So for example, implement a logic that uh, the user 
calls to update the virtual appliance. And then in this logic, there's also a check, okay, which version am I? Am I in a certain update path or not? Uh, with the version that would now be the one that um, updating to, would that leave the path, would not, blah, blah, blah. And then you could uh, message the, the customer or the user that is currently updating, well, do not update to this version because reasons. Um, so yeah, and another problem is um, limited access to the virtual appliances, the A's. <clears throat> As I said, maybe uh, he or she, the admin of the customer, only wants in an offline environment, the virtual appliance. So if something goes wrong and they need support, what now? You cannot access it because maybe they do not have a, how it's called, a jump host or, of some sorts. So you cannot access your product you're supposed to debug. Uh, what you going to do? So that's also another thing that you have to think about. Also, uh, what this also implies is if you need to be, what I also mentioned, if you need to do an update, it cannot be you who does the update because you cannot access it. So, so the user must do the update. He must interact with the machine. And that can lead to um, just uh, usability questions. But we come to that uh, now. Uh, it's a good transition to the second point of customer expectations. Um, that's, OK, the user has now to enter face with the virtual machine and have to do stuff. So why not make it usable for him? Uh, why not make it nice, make it easy? Um, so what could be an example is um, a script or some program you cr created that um, offers the normal things you have to do on the virtual appliance, like an update um, or like a maybe also something very easy, like a restart. So they don't have to type in sudo. Um, what is it? Shut down now or reboot. Um, so just make it a little bit more, a little bit nicer to him. Of course, this is then maybe not the highest priority of things you should take care about, but also certain things. And also with virtual appliances, like for any project, uh, you should always think about guaranteeing continuity, not in terms of availability of your application, but rather if something goes wrong, can the customer, in context of the contract you have with them, can he contact someone of tech? If uh, someone of the team gets sick, can someone take over, especially if some critical bug is occurring, uh, and so back and so forth, or um, the all well-known um, truck factor or lottery factor, bus factor. If someone gets hit by a truck, next day, you lost your virtual appliance guy, what now? So of course, as in any other project, you need documentation, you need testing, basic, and um, more people need to know about the stuff, but that sh should be quite the basics. Um, yeah, and support considerations, that's what I meant. If it's completely locked and you have limited access in terms of maybe no access, then you cannot get first-hand access about bugs at the customer. So you cannot directly access a virtual appliance and see, is this file still there? What does this file contain? What version is blah, blah, blah running? You have to think about what can your customer do to send you certain parts of the virtual appliance so you can then debug these parts. So what uh, you could do, for example, you can make um, uh, like a like a zip file or tar file or whatever that contains specific configuration files or folders or elements of files that are now then um, packed together and then um, our this file is then somewhere on a well-known path on the virtual appliance or maybe even um, retrievable via https uh, for I'm sorry appliance. michael to interrupt yeah. you but uh, we hit 20 minutes mark, so we should slowly uh, go to Q&A. Yep. Uh, so please f uh, finish the idea. Good, Good. Uh, then I talk way too much. Um, so um, then to finish this very important point is here comes the um, pros of the immutable part of your system. Because if the virtual appliance at the customer is the same version as you're on a development machine, 
then this means that uh, it looks the same. This, these parts of the system look exactly the same. You don't need to debug those. Uh, what you need to debug is the mutable parts. And that's exactly what this package then would be for to debug um, what they changed. Good. Uh, besides that, um, good points. Uh, yeah, one, one thing uh, still to mention before the Q&A is the ignition file, uh, because we or, or I did it horribly wrong. Um, ignition is meant to be used once at the first, very first boot of the virtual appliance. That's the idea. What I did is executed every boot. Um, so this is absolutely not how it's meant to be used. But on the other hand, you know that certain files and folders after a restart look a certain way. So you more or less extend, yeah, the term immutable is not really right here, but you know how certain things look like after a restart. So this extends the immutable part of the system. So that's actually, in this case, we had, uh, I had like it worked out well. Good, and um, yeah, said have to skip these things. Um, yeah, okay, we can come to the Q&A. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, talk, Michael. So it seems there is one question for now uh, from uh, Clement Verna. Uh, do you have uh, virtual appliances using Fedora Core OS testing and next stream uh, to test early the OS updates? Oh, um, yeah, um, good point. I also saw that uh, there's a Core OS engineer. At least it was an attendees list. So I was afraid of, of tricky questions. Um, um, this is a good question because when I remember correctly, Fedora, Kes Fedora Core S community as explicitly um, tells you, not tell you, but want you to also use uh, the testing in extremes to report bugs, um, I guess, as a way of paying them back or contribute also to the project. Uh, which I think is very fair, but uh, I did not do it because I was not really familiar with all the setup. And I just read about that in the last uh, two months. And we are um, thinking of ways to implement that currently. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Uh, there is uh, another, answer, another question from Andreas. Uh, from Andreas. Is there a documentation or a how to? Uh, deploy a, a micro shift on Fedora Core OS? Oh, good point. Uh, because uh, OpenShift is one of the main use cases for uh, Fedora Core OS. Uh, but sadly, I do not have experience with um, OpenShift, or I guess MicroShift is a smaller version of uh, OpenShift. Um, sadly, no experience with that. Would also have to Google, <laughs> like like anyone else. <laughs> 